Scream Queens. Welcome to Screen Queens. Ooh, sorry, is- I don't know why I made that noise. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Podcast where two comedians watch, review, and gossip about everything on your screens. My name is Alex J. I am a comedian, writer, and podcast producer. And I am Beck Charlwood, and I'm also a comedian and a podcaster and someone who goes to auditions a lot and then they say no thank you and so that I, that's I you know that's also a skill I think worth that's writing That's an down. excellent skill it's a very depressing skill I also have that skill they're like thank you so much for all of the effort that you've put into this and the time we're not even going to open the file Mm-mm. we're not going to look at it yes. but thank you so much thank you so much for putting on a full face of makeup mm-hmm. Lighting, yes. camera, ring light, set up. Calling your stoned boyfriend over <laughs> to come read lines. Editing. And editing it, exporting it, all that. And then they say, don't worry about it. I'm so sorry. We mucked up. We did not want you at mm. all. At all. Actually, speaking of, mm. the new season of Heartbreak High oh, yes. has come out this week. Which Did you watch season one? No, I didn't. One? I, I skimmed it. Yeah. It's, I'm just, again, I'm not, a, I'm just not into the, I'm just the horny teenager thing. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely not for me, mm, demographic. Mm. But I did do an audition. Oh, you did? For a role of season two of airport person, airport security person. Okay. And I thought it was one of the funnest auditions I've ever done because nice. I forgot I had to do it and I'd had... Two white wines, no dinner. And I realised, I was like, we need to film this now. (laughs) And so, I, anyway, it was insane. And then I was like, that was, for someone who was pretty drunk while doing an audition, that was, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm pretty happy with that, actually. It was was Skip and Sam Bowden helping me out. They were super stoned, holding, try, Sam Bowden. This sounds like a great night. And holding the light. And then Alex is like behind the camera being like, and they got so into it. And they were like locked in. (laughs) It was so silly, and I was like, oh, that's in the bag, obviously. Obviously. Which is what I think after maybe one in 12 auditions that I do, mm. and I never get anything, mm. and this was the same. And so as soon as the season came out, you guys believe I skimmed to try oh, and course. find the scene. Where is that <laughs> like, fucking airport? Fuck got it. <laughs> Show it to me. I couldn't find it. Oh, they got cut. So uh, maybe the whole scene got cut, maybe and it wasn't it personal, and if they had done it. Maybe you would have made it. Maybe I would have been in there. But or if you do watch it and there, you do see the scene mm. with there's someone being a bitch at the airport, yep. tell me who it is. Send, send me the time code. That'd be awesome. I would love to know. Love to know. And then scathe and just feel like, oh. I mean, that's how the entire Australian comedy community is going to feel once The Office comes out. Because I think every comedian in Australia auditioned, auditioned for, for The Australian Office. Are you, how are you feeling? Because I... I'm not I I don't even watch The Office. Like I never Oh, okay. I just never got onto it and yeah. now it's like Oh it's too it's late. It's too late. Oh, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> it's too it late. It was a moment in time. Yeah. Yeah. And but it was like it came out like two thousand and three. Mm. And then the American Office was only a few years after that. Yeah. It's been twenty years. Oh it, yeah, and it wrapped like ten years ago. Yeah. I have thoughts and feelings. Uh huh. And I think they're not uncommon. Mm. I don't know how it's gonna translate. And I don't think it will. And I think what they'll probably have to do in this production is kind of make it a whole new show. Yes. And not lean into the officeness of it all. Yes. Which is going to disappoint a lot of people. Yeah. So I think it's very risky what they're doing. I also think, because I was, I'm still really nervous. I feel like the same way. But when I saw that Felicity Ward is going to be doing the David Brent character, I was like, okay, I have a lot of faith. She's very funny. Yes. And she can do awkward really well. Yes. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, that gives me hope. Yep. But, yeah, it will have to be different. And it, people don't want it to be different. Like, that was the whole thing about the British and American office is literally the fir- the pilot of the American office is beat for beat the first episode of – well, the first season, really. All of the storylines are the same. Oh. The references are the same. But it was fun because you're like, oh, that's what happened and the with other Tim one. and Pam – uh, with Tim and Dawn it. and now it's Jim and Pam. Oh. And, uh, but I just – it's been too long that they can't do that this time. Like, they – it would be insane to just recreate the first episodes of the first two offices. So it, it's just going to be completely a different experience mm. of this remake. And I just, I'm nervous for them. We'll see. I mean, it's been in production for so long. Ever. Yeah, we auditioned like two years ago. Oh, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But we'll reveal it once it comes out. Yeah. We'll chat about it on here. So 
today. This week we it's a it's a heavy one, yeah. but we have to talk about it because it was everywhere. This week we are talking about the five part documentary Quiet on Set, which uh, details the awful things that happened to a lot of kids in the Nickelodeon era of the nineties and two thousands. Mm-hmm. So if this is not for you, it's a very heavy topic. We're going to get into some heavy themes um, and chats completely understand if you want to skip this app mm. if you want something fun though head over to our patreon we oh, dropped a really fun episode on friday that was actually so much fun if you came here for a good time yeah. that's where you could find it yes uh so completely understand if you want to skip next week we'll be doing fun things we'll be talking about the kirby enthusiasm finale so and the new ripley movie and the new ripley as all with tv series i'm not sure which one it is but it's out on netflix and yep. it's got uh, dakota fanning and hot priest, hot priest from, from fleabag, fleabag. <laughs> it's gonna be fun it's going to be fun. He's got a name. We don't know what it is. Yes. <laughs> um, but just wanted to let you guys know that before we get into today's episode. Okay. So how did you first hear about this documentary? TikTok. Yeah. Yep. Just TikTok. I just I kept hearing the words quiet on set and I just didn't really know what it was about. I'd heard the words Dan Schneider before. Right. There's a bit about him, I think maybe a year ago, potentially. Yeah. Because well, um, we listened to Jeanette McCurdy's book on Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Celebrity Memoir Book Club. And then when that came out, people were like, oh, yeah, Dan Schneider does this weird thing with feet. Here's all of the footage. Yes. And that's about the like third or fifth time I've seen like a burst of that on the internet. Of, really? Of like, people being like, look at how bizarre this shit is. Yeah. Okay. And so I'd just been seeing – I didn't even see clips. I just saw people talking about it and, like, anticipating the release of the documentary, like what's going to be in it, how crazy is it going to be. Mm. And then when it came out, ever like, it just bl- it just blew the industry open. Yeah. It was just – so what we're going to – we're going to talk about it because I, I understand if people don't want to watch the documentary, like it is such – a heavy subject, an it's upsetting topic. Full on. I did not feel good after it. No. Like I went to bed and then I woke up still thinking about it. It sits in you. It's it's fucked. It's really sad. So if you don't want to watch it but you want to know what it's about, what, that's what we're here for. Yes. So this is going to be more of a recap. Than we're a, not going to be uh, critiquing the documentary yeah. series. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, that's like we didn't feel comfortable with that yeah. at all. However, in saying that, it is an excellently – told and made documentary yes in terms of you know the things that we love from true crime documentaries like cliffhangers and you know feeding feeding the, the information in an excellent chronological order really starting from the beginning and like building us up so it's like we feel like we're in that time with them. Yes. Um, so it was a huge shout out to the documentary makers. They did such a great job. And so episode one starts at like the genesis of like Nickelodeon mm. of all that was their really big show. Mm. And they, there were two writers that we follow, Christy Stratton mm. and Jenny Kilgan. Jenny Kilgan. They were two female writers who came on all that. And season one. Yes. From and the beginning. The, and then they were on the Amanda show as well. And they were told, like, because they were young writers in Hollywood mm. and they were like, hey, you, this is a great opportunity, but here's the thing. You have to share the salary with this other girl. And they weren't like a duo or anything. No, they weren't like writing partners that came on together. Mm. They were literally two separate women who yeah. were hired and they had to share the entire pay packet. Yeah. And it wasn't part-time hours. It was not part-time hours. It wasn't even full-time hours. We learn it's all time hours. Yes. And very quickly, we've everyone has had a job where you all of a sudden realize it's like, oh, this isn't a job. This mm. is they want this to be my life. This, yeah, they want this Did to be. Did you my ever life. have a job like that? Absolutely. I remember I worked at a homewares store, not IKEA. I know I talk about IKEA a lot. I, I remember this homewares store. Yes. This is where you were working when we first met. Yes. Oh my god. Oh god. Oh, it was, I'm getting oh. Yeah. I had absolutely insane that manager. Crazy lady. Yeah. Who would tell me like these really fucked up stories and be like, you could use that in your comedy. And it was like full of like abusive, like psychopath shit that she was doing to people. And I was like, please stop telling me this. And they put me on as a full time, like assistant manager. And they're like, well, okay, but the agreement is that you work like a couple of hours over time. And I was like 22 at the time. I didn't know. I was mm. like, yeah, a couple of hours over time. Mm. No, that meant every day it was like 12 hour days. And that she would call it like whatever hour and be like, I need you to come in tomorrow. And like, I, uh, one of the expectations is, so if you live in Australia, mm. there is a certain homeware store that 
always has clearance sales <laughs> and they always have big yellow banners. Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden overnight, it'll be covered in these big yellow banners saying clearance, 70% off. Mm-hmm. Like these knives that were $9,000 are all of a sudden 20 cents. $20. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so how that happens is... What happens is you would work a full shift and then the expectation at the end of the day was you would stay around overnight and help put up all of these banners and shit. Overnight? Yes. Overnight. Whoa, dude. Until it was done. Like for quadruple pay, I hope? I don't think it was for any more extra than you would have got. They were just like, but it's a, it's a, it's a team building thing. You know, it's like everyone does it. It's an expectation. It's expectation. And I remember one time I was like, I'm not doing it. Like, I've worked a 12-hour shift. I'm not staying here to whatever, 3 a.m. Good. Good for you. And they were so pissed. Like, <sighs> they were so fucking angry. I'm sick of this shit. I remember one time this, <laughs> this fucking manager nearly got into, like, a physical altercation with someone who was trying to return a fry pan. And she was like, you're not allowed to return this fry pan. And the guy's like, yes, I am. I looked up the law. And she's like, get the fuck out of this shop. I was, like, screaming. The cops had to be called. <gasps> It was crazy. Okay. It was not. It's like, it's fry pans, babe. Dude, it's yes. Not let's all get deep. some perspective. Please. This place sucks. Why do you care so much? It's the expectation of being on call when you're not at work. Yeah. That's what really, that's just, that's the exhausting part of it. Yeah. Is being like, I can't properly do anything because I could get a call at any point that I have to jump, jump on my laptop or jump into the store or come in or whatever. Yeah. So I can't have a drink. I can't like go out. I can't mm. properly relax. And like that's what these women went through. But yeah. like times a million. Yeah. Twenty four seven. This one woman, woman, I think it was Jenny Kilgan, got fired because she went to a concert on a Sunday night one time. Yeah, and it wasn't uh, like it wasn't that she needed to be in the office. It no. was that she was like, I won't be available I won't to be come available. in. Yeah. yeah. And so Dan Schneider is the showrunner. He's the show's creator and he it, we just ve- we learn very quickly that he creates an incredibly toxic workplace, especially mm. for the women on staff. Yes. And there's only two of them mm. and everyone else is male in all all levels of the hierarchy. Everyone's mm. male except these two female writers mm. who are forced to share their pay. Yeah. So that's like that's where we start. That's season 1. Mm. And then season Episode 1. Season one of all that oh, yes, was yes, yes, yes. a Sorry. lot about that. So ep one and two is all about Dan Schneider and his toxic workplace yes. that he's created for both the writers, the adults, and the kids. Mm. The main thing in ep one is learning about these female writers, which I thought was such a great way to introduce us into the toxic workplace world mm. of it all. Like they didn't start with kids stuff. They mm. started with adult stuff to be like, yes. he's even treating adults like this yes and showing how it like builds up and yeah, seeps in up. over time yes no one walks in and is a fuckhead and is controlling it's like you have to put the roots down to yep. like seed your place in there so no one can kick you out exactly it's the frog in the boiling pot of water thing like if you put a frog you've never heard that what is this it's a saying it's like if you put a frog if you boil a pot of water and put a frog in it it'll jump yeah. straight out but if you put a frog in a cold pot of water and slowly boil it around him he will boiled whoa so it's that thing it's like if you start a job and everything's okay yeah and yeah dan schneider just slowly introduces all these terrible male toxic work shit Mm. you're more likely to stay on Mm. because you've been ingratiated into it yeah because you look all of a sudden you look around and everything's different and you're like what the fuck when did this happen yeah and i I'm just sick of men running shit. Like, this is just a perfect example. Like, women need to run more stuff. Oh, except for, can I shout out in this documentary, um, Virgil, the director. The director. Of iCarly. We love Virgil. Oh, he seemed to champion the kids so hard. And when he left, he fucking knew that these kids were going to be thrown to the wolves. Yeah, and the kids who are, so they interview a lot of the kids who are now adults. Mm. And um, even they said that, that everything changed once Virgil was fired off set. The set yeah. changed completely. It yeah. was just, yeah, thrown to the wolves at that point. Yeah. He was kind of like their last champion. Mm. Because what Dan Schneider would do to these women, to these kids, is put them in really uncomfortable positions. Mm. Like you said, with the feet stuff. Oh, that comes in episode like two. Two, yeah. Back to episode one. So uh, these two women are sharing this job. It's obviously awful. The part for me that scared the fuck out of me, and I'm glad we talked about this beforehand because I, mm. 
But what happened was uh, Chrissy was in the writer's room and she was telling a story about something that happened to her in high school. And something like innocuous. Yeah. And Dan said, you know what would be so funny is if you mimed being sodomized while telling that story. And she's like, oh, ha, 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 no. He's like, do it. It'll be funny. And everyone is just kind of like, oh, I don't uh, know. And he's like, do it, do it, do it. And because he's the one that holds their jobs in the palm completely. of his hand. He holds everything. Like there shouldn't – this one man has all the power in all of these productions. It's not n- not normal. And so eventually she does it and because everyone's like, you know – Goading her like, on. It's and silly. We're in the writer's room. We're messing around. It's yeah. not a big deal. And Mind you, there are only two women in this writer's room. Everyone else yes. is male. So the people who are saying do it are male. Who are also in their early 20s, by the way. Yeah. Which is like – and again, it's like it's when you hear it said out loud, you're like, that's insane. Who the fuck would ever do that? But my first thought was if I was in my early 20s mm-hmm. and I'd been in this toxic workplace that I didn't realize was problem, like didn't know. breaking me down from the inside. Me too hadn't happened yet. Yeah. And if I'm in a room with all dudes and everyone's laughing along and the big boss is like, this is will be funny. This will be a funny thing. It's like, I would absolutely do it. I would have done it 100%. Would have done it 100%. And you could see the shame afterwards, her, of like when she gets asked about it. She doesn't want to talk about it. She's like, please don't. It's so, and oh, oh, I could think of several instances where I've done stuff like. Absolutely. In Especially group, in comedy. In comedy. And then just being like, oh my God, please never talk about that again. That was awful. And that's how he did this is every shitty, gross thing he did was always with the thing of, but it's being played for comedy. Yeah. Don't you want to be funny? Mm. This is funny. Mm. And that's how they these type of guys get you is they yeah. bully you. Like they bullied this woman into it mm. because it's like, it'll be funny. You're a comedy writer. You're a comedian. Be funny. It's funny. Yeah. But as we know, a lot of male humor is not fucking funny. It's just derogatory. Mm. And Yeah, exactly. And that's what he was doing. And the joke is, oh, it's demeaning. It's funny that you're being demeaned. Yeah. Like would he have said that to one of the male writers if they were telling a story? Would mm. he say, pretend you're getting fucked from behind while you tell that story? Absolutely not. Yeah. There was one line that really stuck out to me and I think it's so emblematic. By explaining why she did do the act out in that mm. room, she said, I didn't want to complain about anything that would make him think, ugh, there's a girl in the room. <sighs> and that's what we do. Well, hopefully not so much these days, but that's what we used to do is like diminish and silence our girliness, our womanhood, because we don't want the men in the room to think, ugh, there's a woman here. That is such a relatable feeling. Oh, my God. I, I still feel that at times where, especially being in comedy, it's like you're in a yeah. room with mostly dudes. Yeah. And, like, on days where I'm, you know, just, like, not feeling in the vibe with everyone and stuff, it's like I'll shut up and I won't say anything. Yeah. But I like now that I'm getting to an age and getting to a point in society where I was like sometimes I'll be really intentionally girly just to piss people off. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Like even just wearing these tracksuits around, I'm like, yeah. fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. It's true. Mm. That is the feeling though. Mm. <sighs> anyway, so they eventually realise that they're in a fuck situation mm. and leave. And we at the end of the episode, we get introduced to the starting of the Amanda show. Yes. Which is Dan's brainchild. Uh, Amanda comes, he sees her at a open mic a child open mic yeah Amanda D- Bynes this- doing fucking stand up as a kid D- okay because I've always heard that story I've heard it I've never seen it and it was so enlightening to be like who the fuck would take their 10 year old to an open mic like I- hey I've I booked a couple of comedy gigs if someone was like can my 10 year old come and do a set I would be like get the fuck out no, they can't. So I've always been curious about that. But then the reveal was, oh, it is a showcase for children mm. actors who want to showcase stand up right. to agents. I was like, that makes so, so much, much more sense. Yep. And she was so fucking funny. She's so funny. Amanda Bynes, what I like I knew she was a talent, but seeing it all put together in mm. this series, she was a fucking talent. Oh, the life and light in her and charisma. So funny. So funny. So fucking All Wait, the I'm sketches, just... all the characters. Electric. Like an adult. She's working like full time seven days a week. Mm. She looks ecstatic to be there yeah. every moment. Yeah. We see the starting of the Amanda show and Dan really honing in on her and wanting to be like, wanting to create a show around her and becoming obsessed with her. Yeah. And spending a lot of time with her. Mm. Very handsy. Yeah, 
So like, the dude's handsy as fuck. Yeah. And, I mean, we'll run through, but, like, there's been a lot of retroactive look back at those shows. Like you mm. said earlier with the feet stuff, a lot of – there's a lot of footage of a lot of jokes just a, around – based around touching these kids' feet and showing these kids' feet on camera Mm. to the point where, like, almost it feels like almost every joke is for the grown-ups. Yeah. That's how this guy wrote this show. Well, now that we've, like, understand a lot more about what, like, fetishist content is, particularly with, like, TikTok. Yeah. A lot of stuff. If you see a video on TikTok where it's, like, this isn't quite a sketch. You don't understand what it is. A get ready with me video. This isn't. A cooking video. A cooking video. This is something in between of people just messing around with shit. It's not. It's craft, but it's really bad intentionally. It's fetish content. Insane. I had no idea. Of like people just like a, a big thing is like people stepping on stuff, oh, like stepping on. Okay, yeah, feet. Yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah, hugely. And so now that we know that, looking back at these Nickelodeon mm. shows where it's a lot of feet just everywhere, like there's so many feet jokes. It's just awful. Like to to think of putting these kids in this position and these kids don't know they're being put in this position because, mm. of course, the jokes are going over their heads. Yeah. They're children. So they don't know, so they're willing participants. Like, imagine look, looking back on that as an adult, how violated you would feel. Mm. Because it wasn't just that. Then there's that fucked footage of Ariana Grande trying to juice a, a potato. I tell you what, I didn't like that they showed that. So much? Yeah. Yeah. I think they could have showed one bit of it. Yeah, they kept playing it over and over. That water, I, when she's pouring water on herself. Yeah, don't show me that. I agree. I actually agree. It was too much. Yeah, I It agree. was – I understand they were showing it as an example, but they showed it a few too many times yeah. that I was like, I'm really fucked up by this. Yeah, and I, I can remember it from before. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. It's pretty – I knew it before I even started the documentary. Like, you yeah. don't need to show me. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, other other cast members who are put into really uncomfortable positions. There's a lot of racism on set. Yeah. There's two black characters who who we are who we see as adults in the documentary as well. Who <gasps> who was the guy who got covered in peanut butter? Yeah, that that's him. Brian Hearn. The most fucked up one was he got – so they had that weird dare show. Like a Fear Factor for kids, which – I As an adult, I wouldn't go on Fear Factor. Even like I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> when they're like, oh, do you want money to go in the jungle and be covered by worms? It's like this is literally being demeaned. Like yeah. this is being – But dis- at least those people are getting paid like 100K for it. Yeah. These kids are just – you know, you know they're not getting paid well. you for. But yeah. Yeah. And you can consciously as an adult agree to that. Mm. But you're right, there was yeah, Brian was covered in peanut butter and dog set on him. Yeah. That's fucking fetish, man. Yeah. When I saw that, I was like, oh, this is not even we're not even pretending anymore. And also just like the level of danger of like you're letting dogs lick a child is re it's really fucked up. Like the uh, the fact that no one intervened at any point and was like mm the fuck is wrong with you putting them in baths of worms and yep. bugs and stuff one of them like... had a fucking scorpion in their mouth Mm-mm. and so that's what this guy dan schneider did is he created a workplace where everyone just had to say yes to the point where even the parents of these kids were blindsided by yeah. so much of this they weren't allowed on set they were like discouraged from being on set if parents did insist on being on set while their kid was on set they were treated as troublemakers mm, brian's mom brian's mom she tracy was tracy was oh. amazing and what we learned so brian is is was this black kid who was fired because his mom was too outspoken about the shit that was going on yeah that actually fractured their mother and son relationship mm. and we learn in season, in episode five until now yeah they did not reconcile until this documentary so that's the kind of shit like it's not just like in the moment trauma that happens like this can break up families this kind of shit like and she just wanted her kid like to have fun he just wanted to be an actor yeah and he didn't know that what was happening to him no. was awful and he blamed his know. mum for it yeah he sh- should have been obviously we blame dan schneider for it yeah well all the, the other kids were allowed to you know do all this weird shit and their parents weren't stepping in yeah and so yeah, exactly he was like but all the other kids doing it you're gonna ruin my big shot yeah. you're gonna like step on my dreams if you cut this out and she was like no i'm taking the fuck out yeah 
And at the time, it's like, that's going to be so hard as a parent because it's like he hated her until literally this day. Well, like, yeah, but he didn't realise that that was Mm. the instigating moment. And he's done therapy and stuff, he said, like, but he just, it was so ingrained in his life that he didn't until this documentary realise that that's the moment that broke them apart. Yeah. I'm glad they got, you know, reconciled through Mm. this, but fuck. Yeah. So it just, it fractures everything Mm. forever generationally like yeah what's well, interesting the parents so episode two gets into the it focuses a lot on the parents yeah re- like mm. and what they saw and how mm. they were being treated to kind of like separate them from the kids that were on set mm. so I, there was one mother in particular which i'm really glad that she spoke and what happened to her daughter is absolutely awful. Her to go through that as well is absolutely awful. But it was really good to highlight me, like, in a way her mum, the mum kind of just, like, let stuff split. So mm. it was uh, the first time they let a sex offender onto the set. Um, yeah, we learned that in episode two. What was his name? Um, oh, doesn't matter. That guy. That the production it. assistant. Yes. And so uh, he was a guy on set who was friendly with everyone, friendly with all the kids, friendly with the parents, and then he... Lulling them into his false sense of security that I've got this, I'll take care of your children for you. Yeah, everyone's like, we love that guy. He's an awesome dude. And then he's like, hey, by the way, everyone loves me. Um, Can I email with your nine-year-old daughter? Which, like, anywhere else... In any other setting, you'd be like, that's fucking insane. Absolutely not. No, you can't. You're a 30-year-old man. What are you talking about? Mm. But because there's this whole, like, oh, it's Hollywood. He might get her job. I think that's what he was He was promising. He's like, I know people in the industry. I can hook you up. Yeah. Oh. And even then, it's like, cool, talk to the mum then. Talk to the manager. Yes. Do not talk directly to the child. The child. And so then the mum's like, yeah, they were emailing, and I didn't think anything of it. And then he ends up sending a video of him masturbating. To this baby child. To a child. And the mum says, it was awful, and I told her not to contact him anymore, but I didn't go to the police because I didn't want to seem like a bad mum. I didn't want to be blamed for it. I didn't want to be blamed for it. Uh, I can't imagine. Just abs- – it's one of those things – Because you've got to remember this is the 90s as well. Mm. Again, 20 years pre-Me Too or mm. 2000s. But, like, mm. I, it's it's a really fucking hard watch for that stuff too. Yeah. Because, well, like, as a parent, it's like you are a bad parent though. And I think it's important to show that of, like, if you are a parent and something goes wrong, it's like this is what it's going to look like in future of you trying not to be a bad parent. It's like you, your child has had to testify in court – Against oh. a fucking pedophile because you didn't want to be a bad parent. And go to the police. Like. And you just wanted to sweep it under the rug. Yeah. Because then it's the whole thing of, well, how many more people did he do that to after your daughter? Yeah. Like. And, well, and we th- find out it escalates. It, it got escalates. worse. It gets and he so e- much worse. And ended up actually acting on it. So it's like by you being like protecting your own pride and your own ego. Yeah. And trying to be like, well, I'm still a guy. I don't want anyone to think I'm a bad person. Yeah. It's like well, you've done this awful thing. I really, even though it was fucked up and awful to watch, I was like, I think that's really important for anyone. Uh, yeah. Any parents in this who I have was, kids, child actors. When she said I didn't go to the police because I didn't want to look like it, I was very surprised. Like, that's fucking brave to say that on camera right now. Yeah. As brave and, like you said, necessary mm. to show that this is what people can do. We can't do that anymore. Yeah. You got to be like fucking Tracy and be a fucking bitch and be a problem. Yep. Yeah. 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 So then we start getting introduced to this guy called Brian Peck at the towards the end of episode two. Yes. He's the pickle dialogue guy. dialogue coach. And pickle boy. And pickle boy. He Which plays this me. random character that seems to be recurring on the Amanda show of this man who just has a big giant plate. Who cares? Pickle mm. boy is what they call it. Mm. They call him, which is very phallic. Yep. Very sexual. He gets the kids to eat fucking pickles. Ray Romano's there. Mm. Oh, I feel so bad for Ray Romano right now. Oh. How embarrassing. Oh, my God. That scene was 
fucking cringe. That was uncomfortable. And he's like in it for a few minutes. Yeah, just eating a fat pickle, being like, mm, I mm, love this yum. pickle. From Pickle Boy that he puts through a hole in the door, mm. like a fucking a glory hole. Like a glory hole. It's obviously a glory hole. Speaking of, this before is we- a children's show. This is not a this is not a show that's marketed to adults as well as kids. This is purely kids. Who are these jokes for? Ex- okay, so I have a story about this. Is because yeah. I uh, I never watched Nickelodeon growing up. We didn't have Foxtel in our house, but there was one friend of mine who was big on Nickelodeon and Disney Channel. Yeah, big on Drake and Josh as well. More really? To come. Yeah. And uh, I remember going to her house. We were watching. I can't remember what Nickelodeon show it was, but there was a very obvious like dick joke. Mm-hmm. And she was like, her family was like very Christian, and like they weren't like she wasn't allowed to watch Mean Girls, and that was like a big thing. Or South Park or Simpsons. Yes, yes. I wasn't either. But even my mom was like, no, it's important that you see Mean Girls. You're like in high school, and this is like hell yeah, Juliet. Yeah. It's a good thing for you to see. And her mum was like, I can't believe really? that you girls all watch Mean Girls. And we're like, shut the fuck mm-hmm. up. Anyway, and so and she, her mum was always kind of like, saw me as a bit of like bad news. Like didn't like me. You were a bad, bad girl. girl. <laughs> <laughs> and karma is a bitch. <laughs> um, and so we were watching this show and there was a really obvious dick joke. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's weird. And she's like, why is it weird? I was like, I had to explain the joke to her. I can't remember what it was, but I was like, it's obviously about, like, because I've always had a dirty sense of humor (laughs) somehow. (laughs) Even before I had sex, I was like, "Eh, 69. I don't know. I think it depends what kind, it also depends what kind of media you're exposed to as a kid. Like, I grew up watching a lot of, like, you know, Jim Carrey, like, Ace Ventura, like, adult humor. So you kind of, like, learn what the tropes are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it was. So I was like, it's obviously a dick joke. And she was like, what? And she's like, no. And I was like, yeah, th- that's the How that's what it is. It? And her, and she, then she told her mom <gasps> and her mom got pissed at me for explaining a joke in a show that her kid was fucking watching and was like, that's so inappropriate. And I was like, it was on the fucking show. Yeah, it's not like you've secretly shown her South Park and then explained what South Park's about. It was on the show that she was already allowed to watch. Yeah. That's incredible. When you told me that, like, that's that's an in real time experience you had. And I was 13 years old. Wow. And even then I was like, this is weird. Weird. Ugh, wow. So for all of that hullabaloo around, like, Dan Schneider coming out and being like, it's humor for kids. It was like, that's why you're probably not getting it and you're taking it out of context. It's like, no, even when I was a kid, that was fucking weird. Uncomfortable. And all of the hyper Christian kids that are watching this shit, it's going straight over their fucking head. So yep. who is it for? The pervy old men who are also tuning in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we get introduced to Brian Peck, who is the dialogue coach on a bunch of shows, including The Amanda Show. Yes. And very well respected in the industry, incredibly well respected. This is how this shit happens. Mm. He, industry-wide, is beloved. Yeah. Everyone every only has good things to say about this man. Mm. And the kids love him. He's funny. Mm. He's easy to get along with. He cares about them. And then we start to get introduced to the fact that there's some, some, something is a bit off with him. Yeah. He touches the kids a lot. Bit of bit too affectionate. Mm. Um, we learn a story about he at his ha- his house is just a fucking like one room's dedicated to Planet of the Apes, another room's dedicated to comic book characters. This is a man he in his forties. Has letters from John Wayne Gacy, and then we learn he is pen pals, mm. prison pen pals with John Wayne Gacy, and he's not just like interested in him; he's a fan. Like, has letters in his fucking nightstand. Are you fucking kidding me? How did every parent not demand for him? And again, I'm sure there was other shit going on at the time, but yeah. I was just like, sorry, someone who's in contact with your child every day in close proximity is pen pals with a fucking serial, serial killer, killer who murdered young men dressed as a fucking clown. Are you kidding me? Are you fucking serious you right now? You couldn't write this. When they really, like, when they showed that part that, really, that was John Wayne Casey, I was like, is this a documentary or a fucking movie now? This is this can't be real. This can't have happened in real life. So in episode two, we learn basically that Brian, very quickly after the first guy, 
the first pedophile, yeah. was arrested. We learned that just a few days later, Brian is also arrested for mm. pedophilia and no one had any idea that yeah. this was going on with him, that this was in him. Mm. At the end of episode two. Mm. Oh, oh, okay. They're speaking so. to they're speaking to the people who they've already been interviewing, mm-hmm. like who's our who's the director that we love? Virgil. Like Virgil. And they're they're saying, like, yeah, we do know that Brian was arrested for pedophilia, mm. but we none of us know who the victim is. Still to this day, none of us know who the victim is. Yeah. And then Virgil at one point is <laughs> saying to the director, saying was it someone – was it a kid from one of our shows? Like in real time, still doesn't know. Mm. Was it a kid from one of our shows? It wasn't from one of our shows, was it? And then the director says to him, it was a child actor and it was a kid from one of your shows. And you see his heart fucking shatter. 20 you, years later. You see him absolutely just shudder, realising that it's someone he knows. And was taken care of and probably had a very close relationship with. And then we have this incredible shot at the very end of episode two where they bas- they bring out the victim and it's his first time ever speaking about it mm. and it's Drake Bell <sighs> who was the star of Drake and Josh. Yeah, hugely. Nickelodeon darling for many, many years. Hugely successful. And it's like it's so just like the biggest bombshell oh. because it- I'm so, I, my right arm is just – like convulsing with shivers right now, I just can't stop it. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm still even just like, and him just sitting down and being like, "All right, let's," like the like the courage it would have taken to come forward about this shit. I can't imagine because he doesn't. They for any of these kids as now adults to come forward, like they don't know what the reception to this documentary is going to be. Mm. Like now we know that they're. Like the world is supporting them and loving them and really giving a shit. They don't know if this is even going to make waves because yeah. it didn't the first time around. Yeah. So it's so brave and especially for Drake. Mm. He's never spoken publicly about what happened with him and Brian Peck and this documentary is the first time he goes into it. Yeah. And so then it rolls into episode three and trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning on this. Mm. This was fucked up. Like at this point I was already like very shaken by everything yeah. that had been – divulged and then this is just like the worst shit that you could fucking imagine and they don't go into detail about it there's no first-hand account it's one of the most troubling things i've ever seen in a documentary he he says he does he gives a lot of insight he says when the like he sets the scene of when the first assault happened and like it it mostly focuses on just the insane manipulation that this man mm. was able to do on all of these people, his – like all of his parents, all of his kids, the fact that no one knew what was happening. And then we meet Drake's dad. I – my heart breaks for that man. He is so fucking sweet. And he – I really like how they started because the whole time you're thinking, how the fuck did the parents let this? How the how? fuck did the parents let this happen? How how how? And so this episode opens with mainly his dad talking about his perspective of how why they got into acting because yeah. he was going through a divorce and he wanted something to do with Drake and Drake really loved acting, so he brought he them wanted, closer together. Yeah, and so they were going to auditions and they loved it and he loved it and it they were they were best of friends. Everything was going so well for Drake. He's killing it. And then he starts to work on Nickelodeon and... Everything's good for the mm. first season for Drake. Yeah. Drake doesn't have anything bad to say about Dan Schneider yeah. as well to this day. He acknowledges what happened, but that wasn't his experience with Dan Schneider. He had yeah. a close relationship with him. So first season, everything was great. First season of mm. all that, great. It was second season is when shit really started. Yeah. Also, I didn't realise he was the kid on Home Improvement. I think, no, he wasn't in the family, but he had a guest starring role. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, I swear that would have come up. As no, that someone. was Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Oh, my God. Sorry. Sorry. You're, Thank you. You're beloved. Thank you. Yeah, so he had all these guest starring roles on really cool shit. Mm. He was in Seinfeld. He was yeah. the Frogger Kid, which is an iconic episode. Like, he was having a great time. And uh, so then he gets to season two of The Amanda Show and Brian Peck just starts really trying to wedge his way 
in there and separate him away from his dad. Which is what abusers do. He mm. isolated him. He started getting into Drake's head that his dad was stealing money from him, mm. that his dad shouldn't manage him anymore because he knew that Drake's dad had had suspicions. He mm. was uncomfortable with this guy. He was like one of the only people on set who saw Brian Peck for what he was. Mm. And he started to speak up about it. And then Brian Peck, yep, just complete wedge in between them. Yep. And as soon as he got... Drake's dad out of the way is when all hell broke loose. Yeah. He – and, I mean, yeah, that's how it happens. Yeah. He just completely took control of Drake's life. He acted as his manager. Drake lived an hour away from LA, so he would constantly be staying at Brian's house, not on Drake's want, but on Brian's want. Mm-hmm. And no one was looking out for him because dad was out of the picture now. What the fuck was his mum doing? Mm. Well, so I've since – I've watched um, – I mean, we've seen episode five, but mm. I've also listened to a podcast with Drake on it oh. since the – that was done since the since the show came out and he's actually asked for people to, like, just leave his mum alone and he, apparently she's been receiving a lot of hate because she didn't step up and step in and he just – he, he's basically his bottom line is like you just don't understand how manipulative this Brian was yeah. and please stop blaming my mum for okay. what happened. Okay, yeah. But, yeah, it's that I whole mean, thing of just all these, yeah, parents it, just It is one of those things of like it is a situation of abuse where at the time it's like, oh, yeah, we'd let him stay over at this man's house. It's like because at the time it's like there's all these other factors that in your head you're like, well, this makes sense. But yeah. everything's been manipulated yeah. to make it make sense. Yeah. It's like when you break up with someone and then you tell a friend, like, you're like, and, you know, I paid his rent for nine months. And you're like, I'm sorry, you what? And you're like, well, it was. No, it made sense it was, at the time. At the time it, was, it made a lot of sense, actually. And yeah. that's exactly it. That's yes. exactly what's happening all through this period of time for okay. all these kids. Well, I'm glad he said something about his mum because I was fuming. Yeah, yeah. The whole I mean, time. she he might, who knows, in himself, mm. he might still blame her, but he's just asked the public to yeah, lay to off. <laughs> Send her death threats, ETC. Um, um, and, yeah. And, okay, so another fucked up thing that blew my mind is so he was a musician and would do concerts, and Brian would bring all of his mates, like drive hours out of town to go and see him. To go see a 14 year old play guitar and sing. He's like a groupie. It's fucking and so then, yeah, long. it escalates. And for, I can't, I don't think they said exactly how long, but I think for at least 12 months, he was being assaulted by this man and yeah. no one knew about it. Mm. Um, and so then he finally uh, told his mum mm. and his mum was the first one to call the police and put a stop to it. Not his mum. No, his girlfriend's mum. His girlfriend's mum. Knew something was going on. Yeah. Well, it went on for – it escalated uh, like – and so he was at his girlfriend's house and Brian wouldn't stop calling and being like, you said you would come to Disneyland with me. And – it's so crazy that like it just takes someone being outside of the situation yes. to be like, why is this forty-year-old man yep. constantly calling our house saying you need to come to Disneyland with him? This is almost cartoonish, exactly, like at right? this point. Yes, and yeah, you're right. It took someone on the outside, Jake's little baby girlfriend, like a thirteen-year-old girlfriend's mom, yeah, to say this isn't okay. Is every what's going on? Yeah. And it's the first time Drake kind of felt like someone saw him and yeah. saw what was going on and that it was wrong. And then eventually – and then his that uh, girlfriend's mum made him do a session of therapy. Yes. Which is fantastic. So smart as well to be like – not to be like, well, we'll go to the police. Police. You, or you tell me exactly – you tell me everything. Yes. So fucking smart. So smart. And then he uh, eventually – just blurts it all out to his mum on the phone and then his mm. mum's the one who calls the police mm. and Brian Peck is arrested. Um, but it doesn't just end there. Then there's, uh, like, because he's a minor, his, his, his John Doe in the court proceedings and all the court documents, his, mm. his identity is sealed. But for one, Brian Peck only gets 16 months. Insanity. For the list of horrific things that and he... And a full confession... They they had Drake call him on on a, a bugged line and he gave a full confession. It's so scary. Could you imagine? Oh, this poor baby. This poor baby Drake. And he's such a beautiful little boy. Like, mm. oh. And then 
not only does he only get like 16 months, he also has many huge players in Hollywood writing character reference letters of support James for him. James Marsden. James what fucking Marsden. The fuck, cunt? Are you serious? Taron Killam. So I am counting down, being like, please say something. Please fucking say, like, recount these because this is so fucked up. And they, you know, some of them are like, oh, but we didn't know exactly what was happening. No, no. This was for the sentencing. He'd already been convicted. Brian Peck had been convicted of pedophilia. These letters were to the judge around sentencing to say, please go lenient on him when you sentence him because he's a good man and he made a fucking mistake. (gasps) I'm sweating. I'm so mad. God. It was, and there's people that have come out since and been like, what I said was awful and wrong and I'm, I didn't have the right information. I'm so sorry. Mm. I want to see so many more. There's so many more people. There were 41 letters in that. Jesus fucking Christ. (sighs) I've never molested anyone and I don't think I could get 40 letters. Yeah. (laughs) Of character reference of support. I've never done anything fucked like that. And yeah, Jake said it, and it's still obviously something that will traumatize has traumatized him for life. Going into that sentencing hearing and seeing his side of the court empty mm. and Brian Peck's side of the court full. Also, in what? Okay, so in what fucking world? Someone that you, I mean, m- maybe look, we're living in a post Me Too world, and of course that's different because we're so much aware, so much more aware of the abuse of power in sure. these systems and how frequent it is. And could you imagine if someone that we, like, we loved, we really looked mm. up to, was convicted of something like convicted of something like this, mm. and it was like, hey, it would really mean a lot if he showed up the sentencing to nope. show support. Mm-mm. I don't care. Nope, who absolutely it is. not. You wouldn't catch me in there. Absolutely not. When you've been convicted irrefutably, mm. there is no gray area there. No one was questioning that he did it. Mm. All the letters were saying. He made a mistake and he's actually a really good person. It, he, it only would have been because he was tempted. That really A lot of them said that he must have been in a high temptation situation. Yeah, like coerced. this 14 year old boy was tempting him. It's disgusting. Also, the weird vibes of homophobia and this is like, mm. he's gay. So this is a gay thing. And yeah. it's like, how dare you? Whenever, whenever, whenever anyone, especially uh, Drake's dad, spoke out against Brian. Uh, he was told, you're being homophobic. It's just that he's gay and, and affectionate. So yeah. so anyway, huge I ca- – such a brave man, Drake Bell. So, mm. so brave to come forward and tell his story on this documentary. Yeah. Do we want to move on to ep five? Yes. Or is it ep four? Wait. Three and four are all about Brian Peck. Oh. And then five is the round table. Did you see that? Oh, yeah, where there's just like the interview. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I will say I didn't love this episode. I think we could have done without it. Yeah, so they, they released the first four episodes and then because of the massive global groundswell of support for the documentary, mm. they did a follow-up. Mm. So they re-interviewed all of the people but having now knowing that the world knows And Mm. kind of just asking them, like, how's it been since the documentary came out? Yeah. But it was very much just, like, for a news program. It was a a very different vibe to the rest of the documentary. Yeah. I don't feel it, like, I think they should have sat on it for a little longer. There was no new information here. Yeah. And it was just kind of everyone hugging and being like, wasn't that awful? And I was like, oh, this feels private. I don't really know if I should be part of this i agree one thing i did take from it though i love to see drake he seems a lot more confident now yeah than he, he was in the original has fucking yeah. lifted. because he knows that people are supporting him yeah like this whole time like that's what victims do like right is like you blame yourself for what's mm-hmm. going on so there's so much shame around it and now finally he's realized like he doesn't have to hold shame for it he's actually yeah. supported a lot one thing they did touch on in the documentary was that drake has been in recent years charged with child endangerment. Yeah, I did look into that because I was like, oh, hold on a second. What a little wrinkle there. Yeah. Um, He spoke about it on that podcast I listened to. It's called Not Not Skinny, Not Fat. I really do uh, recommend it. The woman who hosts is a really good interviewer. And so he speaks about it. Oh, they interviewed Coco Berthman, who is a cancer con artist. (gasps) Oh. Yes. Who's still at large. Really? Still conning. And so has this whole story uh, that 
a backstory that's fake and has been like using this fake cancer story to get people to give her money and cars and fund her lifestyle. And so she was a guest on that podcast telling her story, which really blew her up. And then they were like, this is kind of weird. There's something not right about this. And then oh, anyway. so, oh interesting. Okay. Not yeah. skinny, not fat. Great podcast. Yeah. So Drake basically spoke about it and he said that what happened was in recent years while he was a musician – uh, a girl slid into his DMs and he engaged with the DMs and mm. you, you kind of assumed that there was like flirty sexual type thing. Yeah. A little while later, he realises that this girl is 15 years old and he cuts contact. This is Drake's, This is what Drake said. Yes. Um, cuts contact. However, the girl keeps um, messaging him, turning up to his concerts and stuff. Uh. I think she's like 16, 17 by this time. Um, and then uh, charges him with basically grooming, saying that he mm. engaged too much back then, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he was very adamant and very confident in the fact that that didn't happen, that it was blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And then for the next two years, the FBI were all over it, all of his socials, all of his electronic devices. Nothing came up substantiating the claims. Damn. However, because he did engage initially with a minor, he was then charged with a lesser sentence of child endangerment. Right. Okay. Because I did wonder why it was endangerment. Yeah, as opposed to assault or yes. whatever. Yeah. Um, and then because at the time his marriage was crumbling, he just put his family through two years of FBI investigation. Oh, he shit. just wanted it to be over. So he pled guilty. Ah. Uh, and he says to this day he regrets pleading guilty. As you would. As <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that story. Yeah. Just in case anyone was wondering. Damn. And also, well, because it lit off alarm bells for me when it was mentioned in passing in the documentary, because a huge part of child abuse is that it creates abuse. Child abuse. Hurt people, hurt people. It's, it's like, not only is it an awful thing, but it's like, you just fucking up everyone's future. That's the like, thing. Yeah. That's yeah, it's not just like in the moment mm. during the assault that was hard. You create trauma and you fuck these people up for the rest of their lives. Yes. And then it's like people then don't have sympathy for what you've gone through because you put someone else through it and it's just yeah. an awful like the most fucked up cycle. Oh. And so that fr when he was like, and there was that thing that happened, and I was like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, Did we can't. Yeah, yes. like we immediately paused, paused and, and was like, wait, 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 we gotta, because I've just felt so sorry for you, and obviously, do what you went through was fucking awful. Yeah, and then you're but like, but is there oh, another I'm child out there now that we're gonna have to yeah. wait for their fucking documentary in exactly. twenty years? Just, and, it's that oh. that that feeling of just, oh no. Yeah. Because you, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are. I'd, Again, there are no good people in Hollywood. There's no good famous people. I was going to say there's no perfect victim either. Yes, there's no perfect. That's a way better way to say no, it. I don't know if that's <laughs> problematic, but like, yeah. Th mm. And that's, I think in that moment, that's what I felt. I was like, oh no, Drake. Yeah. You're not a perfect victim. And I really yeah. had to check myself. Yes. Yeah. On that. Mm. Um, yeah. The last episode was, uh, uh, if you are going to watch it, I mean, you I would. You really get anything from it. Yeah. I think if you've listened to this, you've heard all the fucked mm. up parts. Mm. And if you're upset, then there's no need. But it is important an important conversation. I'm glad it's happening. So important. Like, you, I can't imagine this shit would happen again, surely. Yeah. In I mean, I mean, but it is, though. It definitely yeah. is happening somewhere of right course. now in multiple places. And that's why this shit's important. And it's even if you don't watch the documentary to be across. Mm that this is something that has happened and will continue to happen. Something we do learn in Ep 5, though, is that Dan Schneider has done an interview and made a statement since the airing of the documentary and has taken no accountability whatsoever. Yeah. He's like, I've changed, actually. Bro, and I... Also, he looks fucking disgusting. I mean, that beard. Sorry to be a bitch, but he's always looked fucking disgusting. Oh, he's always been a gross frog of a man. Dude. But. I mean, and, and there's a great point made in episode five of, like, he comes out and makes an apology now. Where was the apology when Jeanette's book came out? Exactly. Where's the apology when this came up, you know, years before? Taylor's all this time. They only apologise when there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. And this is this has been it. Yeah. There's nothing more for him in this life. Oh, who knows, though, because we also learnt that after literally being convicted of pedophilia, Brian Peck got another job on the Disney Channel yep. not long after. Mm -hmm. So who fucking knows? Working on fucking um, 
uh, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Oh, that's right. Children. Mm. So it's final thoughts. Um, this was super upsetting. It At first I did have like – I because I, I, I do have the sick – obsession like with true crime and stuff like this and being like it's fucked up I want to know about it and this is one that did sucker punch me in the face and was like there it is and I was like oh this hurts and this sucks and this feels awful and so yeah if you are someone like me who does indulge in true crime recreationally which I know is problematic uh this is not a recreational watch this is not not easy this is hard and so it should be and Mm -hmm. I think the Documentarians did a really good job of being like, no, no, you will get no juice from this. Yeah, this isn't going to be like a scandal. This is yeah. hard and this is awful. And, and this, this is, is what's going to be fucking real. Nothing was sensationalized. It yep. was very actually something in Ep Five that I did appreciate is they shouted out the two the co directors of the documentary, Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz. Yeah, the all these kids now adults have been approached. You know, several times over the years to speak mm. on their experience as child actors on Nickelodeon, and they've always said no. And something I really loved is seeing these kids now, adults, talking about the reason they spoke now was because of these women directors. They made them feel safe, mm. and they made them feel like this isn't yet a sensationalistic expose. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciated that from Ep Five. Yeah. They definitely. I mean, they've done a fantastic job. Yeah. And they should be so proud. And you could tell that everyone, for people who were deeply traumatized by being on set, mm. they did a really good job of making these people comfortable and yeah. heard yep. and seen. And oh, got to give it up for the the fucking title of the documentary. Mm. That is sticking. Ooh. That is, I mean, that's an excellent mm. whoever wrote that. Yeah, good copy. I will okay. say. I mean, I know that. So many people are beating down uh, Amanda Bynes' door to Oh, yeah. She, yeah, she wasn't featured. She didn't um, want to come on. I don't know if she ever will. And I kind of am like... I don't know if... Yeah, we need it. Whatever it is, it's not good. Yeah. And... Why... She's obviously mm. had such a hard fucking life. Yeah. I can't imagine this would be good for her to bring it up mm. and to relive it in a, such a public way. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> All right, well, All right. we best be off. Yes, we're going to go um, listen to the sound of silence in our cars mm-hmm. and cry a little bit. Just have a moment. Just have a moment. Um, I hope you guys are okay. Um, we had a fun one last week. Sorry, this one's sad. We did. <laughs> and we hey, were also going to do Curb Your Enthusiasm. Finale. But we have run out of time, so we'll be doing that next week. Yes. yes. Um, but, yeah, we love you all so much. Let us know in the comments or DMs if you have any questions about it, if you don't want to watch it, or if, mm. if you have any thoughts if you did watch it. Uh, it's a very important piece of media. Yeah. And we love you. Um, and also, if you are experiencing any difficulties mental health-wise, if this episode has mm. brought up anything hard, uh, the Lifeline number is 131114. Mm-hmm. And we love you very, we very much. We love you so much. And we'll see you next week for Kirby Enthusiasm. Yes, we're really going <laughs> up and down with the vibe week to these ones. <laughs> All right. Love you. Bye. Love you.